This is Kentucky Afield Radio. This is Ron Rohde, Kentucky Afield's first host back in 1953. Now, I'm proud to present Charlie Bagley. There's not a magic bullet right now. I think that it's something that we can tackle, but I do think it's going to take some time. And that's what my job is. And that job is coordinating efforts to control and maybe one day eradicate invasive species of fish and plants menacing our Kentucky rivers, lakes, and beyond. We go inside outdoors with Neil Jackson to discuss the latest efforts to combat Asian carp. Unwelcomed, unneeded, and leaving the future very much undecided. Next on Kentucky Afield Radio. In the news, whales have been spotted in Kentucky waters. We have an expert standing by on the water's edge. There goes the bobber. (laughs) Set the hook. (gasps) Daddy, it's a whale. Way to go, buddy. Childlike wonder for the outdoors. It still exists. Where to go, what to take, and how to get started are waiting at the Kentucky Fish and Wildlife website, fw.ky.gov. Take a kid fishing. Don't let the opportunity get away. Helicopter rescue swimmer, Mike Bearski, United States Coast Guard. Chances are the Coast Guard wasn't there when you went overboard. But when you wear a Coast Guard-approved life jacket, we're closer than you think. Closer when you jet ski, fish, tube, canoe, kayak. There for close calls, when help isn't close at all. Kentucky conservation officers remind you, your life jacket's got your back. And the backing of the best swimmers everywhere. Brothers-in-law, a perfect example of something that is fine in its place. But when they start crowding your personal space, your refrigerator space, your living room, watching what they want on your TV, eating your food, drinking your soft drinks, and you have to traipse around behind them to pick up things and ask yourself, will this menace ever go away? Then you can see how then even a brother-in-law for as wonderful as they otherwise are, can become a nuisance. Unfortunately, this isn't limited to brothers-in-law. It happens with wildlife, such as with sewer rats, starlings, wild hogs. In the plant community, we see kudzu, bush honeysuckle. In the aquatic world, there's plenty of frustrations out there that we wish would go away. One of the biggies is Asian carp. State's Aquatic Nuisance Species Coordinator, Neil Jackson, welcome. Thank you for having me, Charlie. We have spoken, but not since you were in the fisheries division calling in doing fishing reports. I think a lot of people would be familiar with your name and your voice. Do you miss that at all? I do. You know, I noticed this year we've been so involved with some of our Asian carp work that that we're doing on the Ohio River that the spring kind of got away from me this year. I, I was driving home from a meeting in Wisconsin and I realized that crappie were spawning, and I hadn't even thought about going fishing yet. I hadn't even thought to ask anybody what was going on. And so the, I used to be kind of on the pulse with the sport fisheries um, in my previous job, and now I'm thinking about other things. And so that affects what I do in my personal life, too, you know. So now you have moved on, and is terrorizing a good word? Did you say terrorizing? I did. I said terrorizing. <laughs> well, if you talk about aquatic nuisance species, I don't know if that's just a bunch of weeds that got caught up in your prop, or is it something worse? It, it can be worse, you know, but but it's it's hard to rank them in terms of their their potential to affect our aquatic uh, systems. One of the big things that we do when we deal with aquatic nuisance species is we we come up with plans on how these things might affect each of our systems if they are released or if they do get moved around. And and so we, we talk about rapid response. How do we respond to a situation if something, you know, Asian carp's one of the more common ones we talk about. If, if Asian carp show up in Taylorsville Lake tomorrow, what are we going to do about it? Yeah. That's, that's one of our big jobs is to come up with these response plans. Let's give a definition. Aquatic <clears throat> nuisance species. What's that mean in English? In English, it means that it's something that lives in the water or part of its life is in the water. Most of what we deal with spends its entire life in the water. Fish, aquatic plants, snails, mussels, all of those things would apply. Uh, A nuisance means that it has the potential to cause harm to our native species, our species that exist here naturally. There are species here that aren't native to Kentucky 
but they don't always interfere with the natural goings on, if, if I could say it that way. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Some of them have been introduced and they don't really cause much of a problem and we sort of accept that they're here and, and we move on. Some of them interrupt our natural ecosystem processes and cause big problems and we have to address those problems. So those are the ones we should talk about here for this hour. The biggest problem that we're dealing with right now is the Asian carp. And so this is one of the hot spots for the work that we're doing on Asian carp because two of our more important sport fisheries are here. We have Kentucky Lake and Lake Barkley. And we also have the kind of the center of our commercial fishing universe is in western Kentucky as well. And that's one of the ways, um, one of our tools that we're using to battle the issues that we have with Asian carp. And so Western Kentucky seemed like a natural fit um, for that position. You're right there. I would have bet, uh, I don't know, I didn't keep up with Paul Wilkes' travel schedule, but I bet he spent a lot of time down there near you. He did. He did come down quite a bit. And, you know, he had the job when we had that big fish kill below Barkley, too, where a lot of Asian carp died. And so he spent a lot of time down here during that time frame, too. Break anybody's heart that all those Asian carp die? Nobody's upset about it at all. The only thing that we're upset about is, is we can't figure out how to recreate it. You know, I wondered about that. You know, if you could replicate those conditions, problem solved. Right, exactly, or, or at least part of our problem. So we, we have been in close touch with the Corps of Engineers, and a lot of our planning um, going forward will involve discussions with them on how we can try to recreate those conditions that we had that year. We did see some fish die this spring, but nothing like the numbers that we did last year. Did you see the movie War of the Worlds? <laughs> yeah, I you think had I did. Invasive creatures from Mars. They came to Earth. They were taken over, much like Asian carp would do in Barkley and Kentucky Lakes. But they all died out simply because they couldn't put up with the, what was it, the germs in the water and the atmosphere? That's right. The simplest thing God put upon the Earth was the weapon needed to wipe out the enemy. And that came to mind. When you had that fish kill, is it something in the water that they just can't deal with? None of the testing that, that we had done at the time showed any kind of toxins or, uh, you know, a virus or anything like that um, that caused them to die. It was actually more physical conditions in the water that we think had the biggest impact. But it was also hard to point at one cause for the death of those fish. It was actually probably a suite of factors that caused them to die. And so that's one of the things that makes recreation of it difficult. The main one was that they had what we call gas bubble disease. And, and when the water is high in the spring and it's spilling over the top of the dam, that water plunging into the water below in the tailwater causes an excess amount of atmospheric gases to be sort of forced into the water and that their habitat is that water and if there's too much gas in that water that affects their ability to breathe and they take up some of that gas into their bloodstream and that can kill them. You know I'm not a chemist. You'll have to explain that in terms I can understand. Well, what's in it? So our atmosphere is composed of oxygen and nitrogen are kind of the two main components and that is also in our water in various concentrations. And so much like we breathe oxygen from the air, fish breathe oxygen from the water. And that's there because the water interacts with our atmosphere and takes on some of that oxygen. So those le levels for us normally, you know, we, we measure those numbers from time to time and we might find a value that's around eight, something like that, parts per million, although that's not important. During those other times, we might see those numbers being up quite a bit higher higher than they would be in their natural state. And so that's what, what can cause those fish to die. And it seems to be that the Asian carp are more susceptible to that condition than our, other, than our other fish. And so that's why we didn't see other fish dying at that same time. Is there a kryptonite out there, you think, for Asian carp? Well, I'm afraid so far it doesn't seem like it's going to be that simple. It might not be one thing. But I think that it's possible. You know, we had a similar situation with zebra mussels. We were really scared about the impact that they would have on our systems. 10, 20 years later, they're still a problem. Not to say that they're not a problem, but they didn't pose quite as big of a risk as some of us thought they might in the beginning. Our natural systems have the ability to take on these types of challenges and withstand them and, and, and survive it. 
That doesn't mean that it's not really important for us to continue to attack the problem and try to fix it. The thing is, is that we're dealing with unknowns here. We don't know what the final impact of Asian carp is going to be on our native species, on our sport fish. We don't know that yet. Theoretically, there's a huge potential for it to cause great harm. We've already seen that in some places. We haven't measured it in Kentucky yet, but it's likely that it'll happen at some point. Oddities in Kentucky waters that shouldn't be. That's the topic, Asian carp. These are the bad boys that will jump out of the water right into your boat. More in a minute. You're listening to Kentucky Afield Radio. You're listening to Kentucky Afield Radio. My name is Charlie Baglin, and my guest today is Neil Jackson, the state's aquatic nuisance species biologist, and he joins me from his office in western Kentucky. You see this on YouTube. Just type in the search box, jumping fish, and you'll know exactly what we're talking about. What triggers this? So especially at times when the water temperature is warm, um, during the summertime, you won't see them jump much in the winter. We don't know for sure what the mechanism is, but there, something about the sound of a boat motor or the vibration of the boat motor, it triggers their response to flee and what they do, you know, to get away. They, they sense some kind of danger and they want to get away from it. And so their response to that is to jump out of the water. They'll jump in the boat with you. Absolutely. They'll hurt. They're big fish. They are big fish and, and they'll the jump. Way? You know, you'll see them you know, six, eight, ten feet out of the air, so they have the potential to, to cover some ground. How big are these fish? Well, you know, the maximum size, um, you know, the big head carp is not uncommonly in the 80-pound range, although that's not an average size by any means. The silver carp can be in the 60s to 70-pound range. On average, you're going to see fish between 5 and 20 pounds probably. So still a, a big fish, especially if you're running down the lake, you know, going 30 miles an hour in a, in a boat, yeah. and one of them jumps near you, there's a, a serious cause for concern there. It's the same size as a big dog or a middle school boy. Absolutely. <laughs> it's big. That's right. The topic of Asian carp has always been followed up by some statement of, these are delicious fish, and if we could figure a way to get the commercial fishing industry to put their arms around this and catch these fish and send them back to Asia, maybe we can not have as bad a problem as we do. The best tool that we have to remove Asian carp from our waters is commercial fishing right now. Most of the other states that are involved with the same efforts that we are agree with that. And basically, you know, I'll, I'll correct your statement. You know, we don't need to send them back to, to Asia necessarily. I mean, we need to send them all over the world, and we need yeah. to eat them here, too. We should also take advantage of this bounty, you know. We have processors right now who are buying Asian carp and processing them into various products. Some of them are sending, you know, a whole fish back to Asia or to Thailand or other places across the world. Some of them are creating what's called surimi, which is a fish paste. It's um, what's used to create imitation crab meat is the best example, but it can be used for a lot of different things. And other what we call value-added products, where they produce some product that adds value to the fish and sell it as a food product. And so we have companies that are actively doing that. They're growing. We're excited about that. I think that's our best opportunity. And in some ways... Um, what we try to do, even as a fish biologist who is not trained in marketing, we try to help them figure out ways to market their products and how, how we can help in that process. That remedy is underway. That's right. We created an Asian carp harvest program a few years ago, and the reason for doing that was to allow commercial fishermen better access, real-time access, if you will, to places where there were large densities of Asian carp. So places that that used to be closed to commercial fishing might be open to commercial fishing now with strict oversight from our agency. So a commercial fisherman might call us and say, hey, I heard there's a lot of Asian carp below Kentucky Dam today. I want to go fish. We'll say, okay, go ahead. I'll sign up one of my guys or I'll go and we'll collect um, the data on what they are fishing, what they're catching that day, how many fish they catch, what their bycatch is, what other species they might be bringing in, that kind of stuff and then they can go to the processors and sell that. 
And so, yes, that's going on right now. We've been actively doing what we call ride-alongs, getting out with the commercial fishermen, seeing what they're catching, going to the processing plants and collecting data from some of the fish that they bring in at the processing plants and trying to understand how these fish, basically how they're they're working in our waters here because a lot of this stuff is new. We're still trying to answer some of these questions that we have. I'm curious about this aspect. Let's say you were hunting rabbits, and rabbits were delicious, and you wanted the furs, and everything about a rabbit was great. And so you go out and you hunt rabbits. You just hunt them to oblivion. Sort of like what commercial fishing could do to the Asian carp population in the western part of the state. But if you hunt them too much, you're going to wipe out all the rabbits. Now, ideally, I, from where I'm sitting, wiping out all Asian carp would be good. But then that puts some hardship on the commercial fishermen. What do they want to do? Do they want to just control it, sort of like a managed hunt? Is their heart in it enough to let's catch the fool out of these things? What's practical here? What I hear from the commercial fishermen is that they see the Asian carp as a threat to their business model as well. These guys, most of them, have created... um, a livelihood on harvesting our native species, our catfish and our buffalo and our paddlefish. And there are signs that the densities of Asian carp that we have now can harm paddlefish populations and buffalo populations. And so their concern is that here's a fish that's replacing the native fish that I might have been able to get 30 or 40 cents a pound for it. And I can only get 10 or 15 cents a pound for that the, the fish. Yeah, maybe they're a little easier to catch, but yeah. so yeah, they see that bigger. as a threat to their livelihood as well. And the ones that I talk to, their interest is in, in getting rid of them too. Now, you know, you can't predict what's going to happen in 10 years. If these markets get established and they become valuable and then we fish them to extinction, um, you know, people might be upset about that at that point. And those, that's, those are some of the issues. Those are, those are tough questions to deal with. Um, but the way we view it is that this is the one tool that we currently have that we know can work, and we have to use that tool now. Now, in the meantime, if we figure out other ways to deal with them, we're going we're gonna to work on that. But we have, to, we have to do something with the tool that we currently have available to us. I'd also heard that you could also catch the fish, dry them, and use them as fertilizer. I actually talked to a guy on the phone the other day. Uh, He's in Missouri, and he basically was going out bow fishing, taking his fish home, which is the responsible thing to do, by the way, instead of leaving them in a ditch somewhere or laying them on the bank. And he was burying them in his backyard and then... After a while, he was going out there, and after they had decomposed fully, he was taking scoops of that soil and putting it on his garden. And he said he noticed how wonderful his plants in his garden were, and that was kind of his first clue that he needed to start trying to figure out how to make fertilizer out of these things. So they really responded to that, from a miracle grow that's growing in the lake. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so there is a lot of interest in that. I've had a lot of phone calls. Some of our local processors have talked about maybe trying to do that. Um, He's using, this guy was using whole fish. Um, That's, it's also been proposed that, you know, the byproduct to whatever's left over after these processors get the meat off of the fish could be used for that as well. And so those are some things that people are interested in doing with it besides just using it for food. The Missouri Department of Agriculture is providing some grant money to some folks to to try to figure out ways to produce that and maybe scale it up and things like that. So there's some effort going into those products. Sounds like there's a couple of ideas out there that could feasibly work to try to corral this problem. Are they working, and do you think they will be the answer to our dreams? I think that finding answers is slow, and that's the frustrating part, and that's the thing that our you know that our anglers don't want to hear. They don't want to hear, you know, give us a couple years and we'll figure this thing out. Um, that's what's tough. There's not a magic bullet right now, and that's not to say that there won't be in a year, but right now we don't have that answer that says we can go take care of this today. We have to keep working at it. And that's what my job is, is, is to keep working hard at that. Um, but there's a lot of investment. There's a lot of involvement from a lot of the best researchers in the country. 
throughout the entire Mississippi River Basin going to try to figure out this problem. And so I think that it's something that we can tackle, but I do think it's going to take some time. We're talking about the problem just as if it were confined to Kentucky Lake, and it's not. Uh, it goes up and down the Mississippi River Basin. What are the extents? Where are these fish present now? These fish are present from the Gulf of Mexico. I mean, they don't live in salt water, but basically once you get into the Mississippi River, once it becomes fresh water from there, they're present uh, a good ways up the Missouri River as you move west in the Missouri River. They're, they extend in very small numbers, but they've extended out of Kentucky waters in the Ohio River up into uh, West Virginia. Um, They're in the Illinois River. They go all the way up the upper Mississippi River, all the way into pretty good ways up into Minnesota. So if you can draw a line on a river um, throughout the Midwest, you can almost be certain that that there are Asian carp there or they will be there soon. so, so there's kind of two issues that we deal with. One is, what are we going to do with the carp where they're established? And the second issue is, how can we prevent them from getting to places where they're not yet? We will pick up there when we come back. The music is playing. Fishing Report is just ahead as well, and also more about what is lurking just beneath the surface, threatening our fun, our fishing, our boating, and the wet side of Kentucky. Stay with us. You're listening to Kentucky, a field radio. We're back on Kentucky, a field radio. I'm Charlie Bagman. If you would like to hear this show again or share it with someone on Facebook or email it to a buddy, easy to do pretty much. You can go three different places to find it. First is myhuntingandfishing.com. You can also find us each week free on iTunes. And you can find us on our Kentucky Afield YouTube channel. Just put Kentucky Afield Radio in the search box, and there we are. It is time now for our fishing report. Did you grab the mayonnaise? We've got to meet Bob and Cindy at the little store to buy some lunch stuff. Where's John? I said he left something in his room. He's coming. Did you grab the mayonnaise? What do you think? Ham, chips? I put that mustard we like in the cooler. Did you grab the mayonnaise? Oh, oh, here he comes. Good. He grabbed his life jacket. I should have remembered that. Did you grab the mayonnaise? Cupcakes. I want those yellow cupcakes. Uh, Tell your phone. Boaters are busy. On and off the water. That's why Kentucky Conservation Officers remind you. Your life jacket's got your back. By the time you're 20, you have a good knowledge of the course you're taking in life. I'm glad I do. This year, Kentucky Nature License Plates turn 20 as well. These are plates with the Bobcat, Cardinal, and the Butterfly. Kentucky Nature License Plates have helped safeguard more than 80,000 acres of wilderness areas for everyone to appreciate. And I can't wait to see what's down the road. See with me. Next time you renew, choose a nature plate and drive home your support for the great outdoors. You're listening to Kentucky Field Radio. We're back in our second half hour. My name is Charlie Baglin, and Neil Jackson is my guest. He is in western Kentucky with me on the phone, and he is the state's biologist in charge of our aquatic nuisance species. Sort of a dollar and a half way of saying things that live in our rivers and lakes and streams that shouldn't, that shouldn't be there at all. Invasive fish, invasive aquatic plants affecting Kentucky's picturesque water bodies. And on the subject of Asian carp, these monstrous Asian carp, experts say keeping them out of the Great Lakes. What's the concern with the Great Lakes? The concern is that because they're a filter feeder, they eat plankton. They eat microscopic plants and Safe way to safe thing to call it is bugs, basically, that we can't see without a microscope. They're the bottom end of our food chain. They fuel everything that grows from there up. As an example, every larval fish, every fish that's an inch long in the water eats plankton. They eat the same thing as the as the Asian carp. And so if they were to get into the Great Lakes and flourish, and there's there's good information that says that they would, then they would be competing for food with every other fish species in that water. Um, they would be competing for food with mussels that live in that water. Um, they would basically be cutting off the food chain from our, our other sp- aquatic species. And so then you start talking about 
that's their impact on the ecosystem. Well, then they have an impact on the things that matter to you and me, like our sport fish, our smallmouth fishery in the Great Lakes, or, you know, our lake trout fisheries, things like that, cutthroat trout up there, all those types of things that spawn, you know, millions and millions of dollars every year in local economies. You start posing a threat to those types of things. Sounds like there's a lot of sides to this beyond biological, beyond the scientific. There's a political side to it. There's an economical side to it. They all have a stake in this. Absolutely. And that's the thing. You know, that's part of the whole, the big picture for aquatic nuisance species is that this is something that we should all be aware of because it impacts us day to day. You know, every time we put our boat in the water, and then we take our boat out of the water and we move it to the next lake over and we put it in. We have the potential of moving something from one water body to the next water body that we don't want to move. And it's there for, for you know, our sportsmen and women, um, whether or not it's a concern for us or it's a concern for somebody that's working in an in industry where maybe they're pulling water out of a, a farm pond or a stream and moving it to another location. You know, all of those types of actions that so many of us do every day could have the potential to move a species from one body of water to the next, and we want to try to prevent that. Of course, somebody else is going to be the blame. It's never going to be you. It's never going to be me. Bait fish, catch them in one body of water, going to another place to fish, and then releasing them. Is that probably one of the biggest ways they get moved around, at least that's done by humans? Absolutely. There's a ton of potential for that. And, um, you know, we, we have changed our regulations to make it so that, that you, you can't, you know, take fish from one body of water and, and fish with them live in another. You know, we want to limit the movement of those fish. So the main thing that people need to know is just if you're dipping shad and you want to use a shad for bait in different locations, you know, make sure it's dead. Cut it up. Use cut bait. You can fish with cut bait and make sure that you're not transferring live fish from one place to the other. But don't take fish from one location that are alive and move them to another location. It's a pretty simple message, but it's hard to get that out to the right people, you know. Why would anybody want the job you have? It seems like it's impossible. I can just tell you right now, every fisherman you walk up to is going to have a different solution to the problem. People have a voice in this, fishermen do, and uh, local citizens, anybody that cares about water. It sounds like an impossible job, Neil Jackson. It's a difficult job. It's not impossible. And to be honest, I derive some of my motivation every day to knowing that there's a problem that needs to be solved. You know, I don't want to go to work and know that everything's going to be fine. That's not a challenge to me. So part of that is exciting. We're always open to new ideas. I certainly don't have have all of the answers. What I feel like my job is in this process is to either gather the information or find the people that can gather that information or share it with me and make sure that we're all, we're all on the same page. So there, there are people working in the Illinois River. There are people working on the upper Mississippi River, on the upper Missouri River, even just in the Ohio River where some of our work is taking place. You know, we're dealing with multiple state agencies, multiple federal agencies. My role in this for Kentucky is to make sure that I'm getting all of the current information and ideas, whether it comes from a commercial fisherman or a recreational fisherman or someone in another state, and applying that to what our problem is and trying to solve that problem. I asked you once by email, I said, tell me a little bit about your job. And you said, part of what your job is is to make people think about what they do and how it affects the ecosystem. My bet is... Nobody thinks about that. Nobody's going to think about what they do and how it affects an ecosystem. I could live a thousand years and probably would never think that. Right. I don't know what an ecosystem is and how little old me is going to have an impact on an entire ecosystem. An ecosystem is a, it's a big idea to swallow. So think about the stream that's flowing through your backyard and... The fact that there's an interaction between all of the living things in that stream. You've got plankton that baby fish are eating and they're growing up, and then you've got little bugs that live in that stream. You've got frogs that live on the bank and salamanders. You've got plants and trees growing around the stream. All of those things interact to create the ecosystem, and the ecosystem is all of those processes 
you know, who's eating what, where's the water going, it's flowing through the plants and its interaction with the atmosphere. It's it's a complexity that you can't even, you almost can't even imagine it. It's so complex. But our impact on that, and, you know, when you mow your lawn, um, you have an impact on that stream potentially. How's that? Say you mow the lawn and you're throwing grass clippings from your lawnmower or being sent out of the lawnmower into that stream. That's sending little pieces of plants into the stream, and then that, those are being broken down in the stream by bacteria, plants, whatever else. So you've had an impact on some of the organisms that live in that stream. Um, so literally everything we do day to day is having an impact on what's going on in our surroundings, and we may not see it. A good example of this from, say, a fisherman's perspective would be when I go trout fishing and I'm waiting. I put my waders on, I walk out in the stream, and I fish for trout for a while. And then when I'm done, I walk out and I throw my waders in the back of my truck, and then I go on and do my thing, go to work, whatever. Well, the next time I go fish and I go to a different stream, and I throw my waders on and I walk out in that stream. Well, it's possible that what was on my waders when I left that first stream might be a kind of algae, there might be a snail on there, there might be something that I moved from one stream to the other. And so we have these t these potential impacts. One of those could be a species that we don't want to move around. It could have a big impact on another species in the next stream that we go to. So you're saying these streams aren't all made out of the same things. They're not homogenous. That's right. So there are different things in different streams. That's right. And one may not be able to live in the next or would not have the pieces of the puzzle that they're that that keep something in check and so they grow out of hand they grow they proliferate that's right when you introduce something new um to an environment that they they haven't lived in before they have the potential to sort of take over they don't have a natural predator for example um and they have the potential to become a, a bigger problem than they might have been otherwise the mud in my cleat wouldn't be the same mud that I would put into the water even if I had walked 20 miles away. I, I don't understand how everything can be that different. I imagine I'm not the only one either. Yeah, it's hard to it's hard to to visualize some of these things. It, it might be a, it's a little bit easier to to think about moving fish from one body of water to another. You know, um, it's a little bit easier to think about moving plants. You know, some of our plants that that our fishermen love um, are actually considered aquatic nuisance species like hydrilla or Eurasian water milfoil. Those are plants that weren't here at one point in time. And, and it's true that in some places they create some really good bass fishing, and so a lot of people like them. But they also create conditions where they can grow so thick in an embayment of a lake or in a, in a section of river that you can't drive a boat through it. Mm. And, and nobody wants to see those conditions. So that's a little easier to think about the potential of moving that plant from one place to another. Plants coming from one place to another. Kudzu may be an, a pretty good example. Yeah. Dandelions, another one. What's some, what are some invasive nuisance species that we see every day that we just take for granted as, just, as part of what should be there? You know, I always think about the common carp. Most people that fish are familiar with the common carp. We've had those things around for over a hundred years, and they were I kind of think of them as one of the original invasive species. They came from Europe, and I would say we call them naturalized now. They've been around long enough, and I, I've always thought, you know why why aren't we worried about those they They weren't here originally. they have some impact on our native species and we kind of just got used to them, and so we, we don't view it as a problem. One of my colleagues said the other day, he said, yeah, but think about how things might be if we didn't have them. Maybe they'd be that much better. There's a broad spectrum on how we think about these things, but that's the common carp's one example of something that we just kind of we overlook. A lot of our plant species that we see in ponds or in, in rivers um, are invasive species. But maybe, you know, there's a different scale for the level of invasiveness, too, you know. 
We try to attack the ones that pose the, what we think are the biggest problems. We will pick back up there in our final few minutes with the Aquatic Nuisance Species Coordinator for the state of Kentucky, Neil Jackson. My name is Charlie Baglin, and you are listening to Kentucky Field Radio. We're back on Kentucky Field Radio. My name is Charlie Baglin. Neil Jackson is my guest. You see it in politics. You see it in the cost of living. We even see it in weather extremes. If a disease comes along or a pest of some description, say the blight that wiped out the American chestnut tree, not only did we lose these huge trees, we lost their lumber. We lost chestnuts. Maybe you and I can eat something else, but bring that up to a deer, a turkey, a bear, a squirrel, and that was a prime food source. And when there's a shortage of food, what happens? Things starve, populations shrink. Things are out of whack, out of balance. That's right, and that's, you know, that's a good point. We're looking for balance. And that, you know, our goal for any given aquatic nuisance species is to, rid, you know, completely rid our waters of them. Let's just get rid of the problem. Well, that's not a very practical um, situation for the most part. So that's still our goal, and that's still what we're working towards. In the meantime, we'll try to figure out how we can manage these populations and get to the balance that you're talking about. Let's figure out how we can still have the sport fisheries that we want and still have the natural processes that we want in our ecosystems. And and maybe we can do that just by decreasing the numbers of some of these aquatic nuisance species to levels where we can manage them. I've got a few lists, things on my list here, Neil, I'm trying to look at. We've talked a lot about the Asian carp. Here's something I think that I probably myself have done. Gone to the tropical fish store. That's not something I've done in the last 20 years, but maybe as a kid. And the fish, uh, I'm tired of them, whatever. I take them down to the creek or I take them to the river or the lake. I turn them loose. Is that safe? What do you think? Not at all. Not at all. Um, you know, some of those some of those plants may have come from the other side of the world, and we have no idea if they'll live in our waters, if they'll live under our temperatures outside. But if they do, they might take over an area. They might impact a local ecosystem like we talked about earlier. They might outcompete one of our native plants um, that we like having around. Um, so definitely, it's not a good idea whether it's a plant, whether it's a fish. You know, we we run across big goldfish in our in our sampling from time to time. We found a fish called a paku, which is it looks kind of like a, a piranha, although it's not a piranha. Um, you know, we see it, we see fish like that from time to time, and we know that they're releases from aquariums. Um, so we know that people do that. Um, another really interesting example that I saw at a meeting a while ago was um, it was in another state, but they were looking into their crayfish populations. And they found a bunch of species of crayfish that they didn't think that they had, and they came to find out that their local schools were using crayfish that they purchased from a biological supply company to observe, you know, biology in the classroom. And at the end of the year, they were having these these um, release parties where they'd go out to the local lake and release these crayfish. They had no idea that they were releasing a species of crayfish that wasn't there naturally. And they, that's one way that these crayfish got moved around. And so it's really amazing how what we call pathways, ways that these animals or plants can get moved around that we don't really think about day to day. Well, I know even like first grade classes will raise butterflies in the classroom, and they'll go out and release them. I assume that they're native to the state butterflies. These things, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it's, that's and that's what I'm talking about when I say the, the awareness, the importance that we understand what aquatic nuisance, not just aquatic nuisance species, but, you know, we understand our potential to move animals around. Um, it's it's really it's pretty overwhelming when you start wrapping your head around it. How many potential ways we we can change the environment around us? If you have been on an airplane from a foreign country coming back to the United States, or maybe even going to the foreign country, or coming back from a cruise from ex exotic islands in the Caribbean, there is a form that you fill out that says, "Have you 
been on farms? Do you have mud in your boots? Do, do you, are you bringing in fruit? That type of thing. It's not that they're just curious. They want to know because there may be some seeds or plants or wildlife or organisms in there that could grow and grow out of hand here in this country. That's right. That's right. I mean, you know, there's, just, there's so many examples. We could talk about it all day, Charlie, about all the different ways that you could potentially bring something to our state that wasn't here before, you know. Let's close the show by talking a couple of things here. One thing people in Kentucky like to do, especially in the warmer months, is boat. What are some basic tips you can give to make sure you don't spread something to another body of water that shouldn't be there? The main thing is just kind of a basic inspection. When you pull your boat out of the water, look around on the trailer, look around on the bottom side of your boat, make sure there aren't any plants hanging off the trailer, um, make sure there's nothing stuck to the trailer. You know, it's possible you could pick up a type of of muscle, like a zebra muscle or something like that. Um, for most, um, you know, sport boaters, that's probably not going to be a big problem. Also, make sure you don't have any place in the boat where you're storing water. Maybe you've got a ballast. Some some ski boats or kneeboarding boats, um, wakeboard boats have ballast in them where they can take water from the lake and fill up a ballast. Make sure you drain that water back into the lake before you pull your boat out of the water. Um, live wells, you know, for fishermen. Make sure you don't carry water around in your live well. You can you can go the next level up and make sure you're not moving stuff around by treating your live wells and your ballast with bleach. Um, you know, when you get home, pour some, some bleach, uh, a solution of bleach and water in your live well, and, and that will keep your boat cleaner, and it will also make sure that you're not moving something from one lake to another. Smart ideas. Bill Jackson, I sure appreciate this. always have a question. I asked all my guests, do you text and drive? I do not. That's a good man. Text and fish? Only if they're biting. (laughs) And you're texting the photos to friends to make them envious. That's right. I appreciate you helping. Good luck to you. Thanks for having me, Charlie. And one thing we really didn't hit on is that this is a two-way street. Plants and critters that live here in Kentucky, in harmony with everything else in Kentucky, can make its way to other parts of the world and really go berserk. That news story sometime back about Johnny Depp taking his dogs to Australia and the dogs were ordered to be sent back or be executed, that was to keep rabies out of Australia, prime example. There's a website you can check out, anstaskforce.gov. We are out of time. This is Charlie Bagman inviting you to join us in a week, and we'll go inside outdoors again right here on Kentucky Afield Radio.